The Game Boy Advance has an oddly soft spot in my heart. I never really grew up with it, but yet I still think it's one of the coolest handheld devices ever. It's slick, it's clean, it's cramp-inducing. What's not to love? But based on the Game Boy Advance library, I think it's safe to say Super Mario wasn't Nintendo's top priority? Mario uh, doesn't have an original platformer on the GBA, which is surprising. Like, he has a mountain of spin-offs but no 2D platformer of his own. Instead, we got a lineup of remakes of older Mario games under the title The Mario Advance Series. And these re-releases go a little bit something like this. First, we have Super Mario Advance 1, which is actually a remake of Super Mario Bros. 2. Then we skip ahead to Super Mario World Super Mario Advance 2, which is a remake of technically Super Mario Bros. 4. Then we have Yoshi's Island Super Mario Advance 3, which is a remake of the prequel slash sequel of Super Mario World Yoshi's Island Super Mario World 2. And then lastly, we have Super Mario Advance 4 Super Mario Bros. 3, which if you're looking at the timeline, is actually the game released before Super Mario World and Yoshi's Island, but yet yeah, it's the fourth installment of the Super Mario Advance series. Simplicity at its finest. Now, even though this series mostly consists of enhanced visuals with a few new additions, I love these games. Having these Mario titles in handheld form really puts into perspective just how advanced the Game Boy Advance was. At one point, these games were technical phenomenons in their respective years of release, so remaking these games for the portable GBA was an incredible feat nonetheless. They may not be original Mario games, but I do enjoy this series, and if I had to choose a favorite my pick would have to be Super Mario Advance 4. This is one of the smoothest platforming experiences I have ever played. It feels great, the graphics are colorful and timeless. It's the definitive way to play Super Mario Bros. 3. Not because the original is bad, but mainly because it has modern enhancements and features like saving, cutscenes, DLC. So you're probably thinking, GBA, DLC? ABC123 introducing the Nintendo e-reader. What the heck is an e-reader? It was a peripheral for the GBA that flopped in just a couple of years of being out on the market. Essentially, it was a tedious tool of unlocking extra content for specific games, kind of like an early form of DLC. However, the content you would download wasn't from the e-reader itself, but from e-reader cards sold separately. Extra content, or whole games, had bits of data stored across multiple cards. So, for example, if you wanted to play a game straight on the Nintendo e-reader, you would have to scan a pack of five cards with each card having two barcodes to scan, making for a total of 10 times you would have to just sit there and scan cards just for you to play some Donkey Kong Jr. Was it worth it? No! It didn't really do so well here in the US, so it's understandable why so many people don't know anything about this thing. And the only reason you would know is because either you had one, or major Nintendo nerds like myself tell you about it. Super Mario Advance 4 was one of the lucky few to be supported by the e-reader, and the biggest inclusion it brought to the game by far was the addition of full-blown bonus levels. If you've played Mario Advance 4, I'm sure your eyes have scanned over this option on the file select screen, the level card. This would take you to a mysterious separate island called World E, and from there you could start scanning in new levels. I mean, I wish it was that simple. Uh, first, you had to have two GBAs along with an e-reader, link cable, e-reader level cards and a copy of Mario Advance 4. First, you would plug in the e-reader to one console, and then you would boot up the game on the other. Then you would connect the link cable to each Game Boy Advance, set up each end of the connection to send and receive, and then you would begin the process of swiping multiple cards to download brand new levels onto your cartridge. No wonder this thing failed. This company, you know, I love them, and with this love comes honesty, and honestly speaking, Nintendo makes some really stupid decisions. But you know, with a company like Nintendo that literally throws anything and everything at the wall, eventually something sticks. What I'm referring to is Nintendo randomly deciding to preserve this lost e-reader content via their virtual console service on the Wii U, and eventually to Nintendo's online service on the Switch. Why, you might ask? <laughs> well, the, the best answer I can say is it's Nintendo. You can't spell unpredictable without N-I-T-E-D-O. 
the O is up here. This was kind of an out of the ordinary W from Nintendo. For a company who doesn't care all too much about game preservation, this kind of shocks me because this content is pretty obscure, even having some content exclusive to Japan. So for them to go out of their way to make these levels this accessible is kind of out of pocket for them. That, I mean, that's actually pretty sick. And let me remind you, this first happened back on the Wii U, you know, the bottom of the barrel era of Nintendo. They decided to release decade-old DLC for a random Game Boy Advance game that's a remaster of a game they already had on the Virtual Console. Tell me you're desperate without telling me you're desperate. Looking back, I didn't know anything about this hidden content up until the Wii U, and I didn't get a chance to try these levels out until, well, now. That's right, if you're paying for the Switch Online Expansion Pack, you gain access to the unique world of Mario Bros. 3 DLC. So, that's what I'm taking advantage of today. I gotta make this $50 investment worthwhile somehow. The idea of having additional post content in the form of new levels was very innovative for the time. However, it was just a little bit ahead of its time. During Mario Advance 4's development, Nintendo knew the e-reader was on its way to the grave, so they decided to use this game as an opportunity for one last hurrah. I'm just assuming that's the case, though. The game was released in North America in October of 2003, followed by the e-reader being discontinued in early 2004, so I'm just kind of reading the context clues here. And with it being their last effort before the e-reader's death, you can tell they put some good effort into this content, because the levels we got here are really solid. I like how the first few levels are recreations of the first levels of Super Mario Bros, even going as far as creating the iconic Bowser battle from the first castle on the NES. I mean, like, that's just so charming. Aside from that, a lot of the level concepts are fairly original. Levels that revolve around the Goomba shoe, levels that have the ground solely made out of note blocks, levels that auto-scroll and force you to balance on para beetles for the entirety of a long, grueling level that made me want to bash my Switch against my head. <laughs> I love the para beetle challenge. A lot of these concepts are great, but I I think most of the originality comes from the remixed assets they added. Essentially, these levels are a celebration of all the Mario Advance games combined. You could argue that this was the Game Boy Advance's original Mario game. I mean, it really did feel like a whole separate mode from the base game rather than just a set of bonus levels. It has its own set of collectibles, its own world with unique minigames. Personally, I don't think it has enough content to fully claim to be a Mario game, but if they would have ran with this idea a bit more, I think they could have fleshed it out into its own adventure and created the ultimate Mario Advance game. It kind of gives off the vibes of a ROM hack, because everything is set in this Mario Bros. 3 engine, and yet there's so many new additions from previous games. The biggest example is the amount of enemies they pulled from different titles. Charging Chucks from Super Mario World, these penguins from Super Mario World 2, these snow creatures from Super Mario Bros. 2. I was genuinely shocked to see how many assets they used from multiple Mario games, and this doesn't just stop there. They even stripped multiple items and mechanics, like the cape feather from Super Mario World? This looks cursed on so many different levels, but I love it. Picking plants like in Super Mario Bros. 2 makes its return, which is super sweet. I've always loved the variation of attack this mechanic brings, so seeing Mario Bros. 2 get some love always makes me happy. They even included their own special collectible coins. First, we have the E coins, which are a rare smaller set of collectibles placed in specific levels. And I'm happy to report that when you collect every single one of them, nothing happens. Other than for the satisfaction of completion, they serve no purpose whatsoever. There's this castle that displays each one after collecting them, which makes me think they initially played a bigger role, but nope. They also have the Advance Coins, which are simple collectibles hidden across every level. Most platforming collectibles are just ways to increase longevity, and while these do do that, they're also used to unlock access to the minigame houses. One interesting feature about World E is your coins are actually used as a currency. I know, who would have thought? All your coins you collect carry over from level to level, which in turn can be used to play three different minigames. They're very bare bones, with the first minigame being complete trash, while all the others are interesting distractions to get more items. Here's my tier list. 
please keep the riots to a minimum. As you can see, they put a good amount of effort into this obscure content. Good level design, remixed assets from previous games, an interesting separate world with its own little games and collectibles that could have played a bigger role. But you know, part of me likes to think what could have happened if they just fully ran with this idea. Instead of delegating it to the e-reader, the GBA could have gotten a really unique Mario title. The remixed idea is super charming, and I think they could have taken some more steps with it. Maybe having all four characters from Mario Bros. 2 be playable. I think it would have been sick to see some more parts of Dinosaur Island that never got explored. Maybe mix in some Yoshi Island levels to switch up the gameplay a bit. The idea of mixing all these remakes together into an original Mario title is, in my opinion, a really sweet concept. And the cool thing is, they somewhat did that here. I'm not complaining about what we got here, but what I am saying is if you're willing to go the extra mile on creating this amount of content for a dying peripheral, why not just take it a step further and release it on something that's, well, you know, good. It's really cool that Nintendo made this obscure content accessible again, because media like this can get lost so easily. Having access to lost content is one thing, but having said content be 38 handcrafted Mario levels from Nintendo just makes it all the more sweeter. The levels are solid, I got a kick out of seeing Mario like this, so yeah, if you're an avid Mario fan like myself and haven't tried these levels out before, I think it's a super cool piece of lost media that's worth checking out. Thanks for watching. Let me know if you like this video by dropping a like or a comment. Really, anything to support the channel is uh, greatly appreciated. But again, thanks for watching, and I'll hopefully see you guys soon.